Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Susan Rattan, and I am the service leader today, assisting Reverend Rosemary Morrison. We are one of two Unitarian churches in Edmonton, and one of many Unitarian churches across Canada. This, the, the, the Unitarians arrived in Edmonton 111 years ago, and this congregation will celebrate its 70th birthday this spring. And now, ask everybody to silence their devices. And we will have some announcements, starting with Andrew Mills. Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Mills and I have the pleasure of being the treasurer of this church and today I want to talk about your comfort. These chairs are 55 years old. They were bought when uh, the previous church was opened, uh, way back when, I have it on good authority. And uh, 20 years ago, we updated them and changed the fabric and painted them a bit. But they're 55 years old. It's probably time for an update. So in the newsletter, I put out a call. I'm looking for one or two people who would like to investigate uh, what new chairs are available to us uh, for churches. Um, I've got some money available so that they can actually uh, bring some samples in and then we can vote with our butts. And uh, at the annual general meeting, we'll decide whether we want to move forward with buying some new chairs for our sanctuary. Um, we don't actually have enough of these. You can see the chairs over there, but we actually need more than what we have. And these chairs are getting a little down in the tooth and uh, it would be great to do an update on that. So I'm looking for one or two people to form their own little committee to do the investigation. There are some rules. Uh, to do the investigation, there are some guidelines, and uh, prepare a report to the congregation for the AGM where we would then decide whether we go ahead and buy new chairs. Thanks very much. Now, I believe Ruth Marriott is coming down to talk to you about what's going on out there on the table, the Right for Rights campaign. So we'll just wait a second for her. Good morning, I'm Ruth Marriott. Sometimes you don't see me because I'm at home online and sometimes I'm upstairs helping with the Zoom production on there. December 10th of every year is Human Rights Day around the world. And Amnesty International runs a Right for Rights campaign internationally to focus and protect human rights. Those of you in the church building may have seen the tables and the setup in the foyer when you come in. And those of you online have heard uh, Jeff Bazantz providing them with information and putting a link into the chat. If you're like me, then over these past several months, the war situations in the world are pretty depressing and distressing. And the thing that makes it even harder is how powerless we feel about those things. Well, that's the great thing about Right for Rights, is you can do something meaningful. And it's not up to you to figure out what you should do, what message, who to contact, how you should organize. Amnesty International does what research they boil down the information. They provide everything from a short description of the situation to sample letters, mailing addresses, email addresses. So there's a wide range of options. You can write a short letter using the example as inspiration. You can send an email, sign an electronic or a paper petition, petition or get on social media. You can send a message of support to the people who are affected. Last week, Marilyn Gay told you about the Zimbabwe women who had been freed as a result of last year's Right for Right campaigns. Well, another example uh, is of the 2021 Right for Rights, where the Guatemalan government 
released an indigenous man who had been um, imprisoned for trying to protect land and water rights. And he was freed several months after Right for Right shone a lot of attention on his position, on his situation. And late breaking news, Marilyn Gay has told me that there is information on a 12th case having to do with the Israeli Gaza war situation. So you can see her after the service and online we'll try and get some information out to people electronically. Join us today if you can, but if you can't, that's okay. I'm probably writing my letters late on my own and could be after Christmas. The campaign runs right through to January. All you need, all the information you need can be accessed through the link in the December newsletter. So I'm often reminded of our motto, it's better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and it is my pleasure and honor to serve this congregation. Uh, I have a couple of things I just wanted to say. Uh, the last few months, we've been having a Third Friday event, uh, and this month um, we're not going to have that. There's just so many things that are uh, vying for our attention, so many extra things. So we decided that we would go ahead and do uh, another spaghetti and karaoke night in January on the third Friday of January and also resume our UUs on tap um, the last Monday of January. So those two things are, you don't need to worry about them being on your calendar. Uh, so there is an ex also, and instead of, not instead of, but uh, there is a, an extra service this month on the 19th, so a week, um, this coming Wednesday, a blue Christmas service. If this time of year is perhaps, um, I like to say, all not, not all twinkly lights and, and gleeful moments, um, you're invited to come and, and uh, sit and reflect uh, in candlelight, and it'll be an in-person only service, um, sorry, um, but it's quiet, private, personal, and um, low-tech, so we won't have Zoom. Uh, Zoom uh, support on that evening, December 19th at 7 p.m. Now let us begin. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a rich mosaic of free thinking, spiritually questing individuals joined in common support and action. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. We gather in gratitude this morning on Treaty 6 land. A treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and an ongoing relationship. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all of our children. <coughs> and now Karen Mills will play a prelude. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Karen. Uh, Jan McMillan is going to be our chalice lighter today. And I'll read these words and then Jan will light the chalice. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, and to each other. Thank you, Jan. Now we get to sing hymn 389, Gathered Here. I heard a rumor that we were gonna do this as a round, is that true? Why not? <laughs> well. I can lead it. Or do you want me to do, I mean, yeah, you lead it. Keep my mic on, John, a little bit. Okay, gathered here. So we'll sing it all the way through once. And then we'll sing it in, uh, in a round. And I'll, I'll bring the second half in. And so if you wish to uh, rise in body or spirit as you feel moved, and we will sing gathered here in the mystery of the hour. We'll sing it through once in unison and twice as a round. All together. Our community is entirely self-governing and self-supporting. We provide all of the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and institutional well-being. And do we have people who are going to pick up the, hmm, there's one. Okay, no, nope, we're good. Um, our, uh, okay, we also every week so help others. One half of the unidentified cash that is received each Sunday is given to a special organization or cause. Our cause this month is Reverend Rosemary's Discretionary Fund. From time to time, she is approached by congregation, congregants and community members for help in a financial crisis. This could be a crisis around rent, food, paying utility bills, or any number of requests. Yes, please pass. Reverend Rosemary uses this fund that is accessed upon request. This is an opportunity for you to directly and positively impact someone's life and make it better. Please give generously. And we will now sing from you I receive, and it will be up there.
Audrey. I am. Audrey Brooks is, Reverend Audrey Brooks is going to read our Advent lighting words for us this morning. This is the liturgy for the lighting of the Advent candles. The placing of candles upon a circle of evergreens is an age-old tradition, lighting additional candles each day or week as the light wanes has been part of human rituals for centuries upon centuries. We are warmed by the glow. We are reminded that the wheel of the season will turn and brilliantly lengthening days will return. The original Advent wreath in the Christian tradition dates back to the 16th century and included a candle for each of the 24 days leading up to Christmas. For us here in this time, the circle of evergreens reminds us that life and love will never end. We light candles each week with anticipation as we know a new season will soon be here, hopefully. Days will become longer and we'll know the warmth of the candles will soon be replaced by the warmth of the sun. Last week, the first Sunday in Advent, we lit the candle of hope let us now relight that candle as we continue our journey toward the sun and the new life it brings. The second candle of the Advent wreath presents peace. In this time of expectancy and celebration, let us hold on to the ideal of peace, even though wars are raging around us and around the world. Sometimes in our hearts, we can still recognize that peace arrives gently and to an open heart. We light the candle of peace to remind us that it is within the softness of a dove's wing that peace descends upon us. We light the candle of peace. Amen. Yes, we are now going to do a favorite Advent hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and it will be up there, and Karen will play.
so the service leader gets to do a reflection uh, as part of the service. Not, not too long a reflection, but some words. And uh, here goes. We are in dark times at the moment. We see children and their families dying and struggling in Gaza. We see parents and family members in Israel holding pictures of the people who have been captured by the terrorists. We see in Ukraine two years practically of fighting and still no end. And in this province, we have a government that is deeply worrying. We have people in this rich province with not enough to live on, struggling. And in all of that, not to ignore it, I think we need some magic and mystery in our lives. Something that may be a small thing, but right now you just hang on to. And I want to give you a few examples of these things in my life in recent months. The first one I want to mention was in November when we had a moon in the sky, I think every night for two weeks. It was just spectacular, and often it had a little planet Venus next to it. And every time I went outside in the evening, I watched for it, or else I looked out my window. And the next morning, I walk often in the morning, I would look up and then the moon would still be there, just in a different place. And it just made me happy, it made me grateful. Second thing that makes me grateful is the people in this church who do so much work to keep it going. And I want to mention in particular our two choir leaders uh, who are both here today, Gordon Ritchie and Karen Mills. Those of us who go to choir know that these two always make it a good experience. They're never grumpy. They're, they make it fun. Gordon, well, maybe she makes it grumpy to her husband. I can't speak for that. But she makes it great for us. And Gordon has written us two new songs. And it's just such a blessing, and it's given to us just for showing up. Third example is the food bank, which we have a depot here at the church on Wednesday evenings, and I uh, work at it every second Wednesday. And you might think that's a depressing thing, but it's not. These people are not homeless. They just don't have enough money for food. And we try to make it a, a good, friendly experience. We love it when they bring their kids, and, and some of them do, particularly the Ukrainians. They seem to have a lot of little kids. And the kids are thrilled to be at the food bank, and they dive into their parents' box of food, and they pull out a can and say, look, we got this. And it's, it's a can of green beans or something like that, <laughs> but they love it. Last example is from my backyard. I have a huge backyard, and 24 years ago, I got it landscaped, and the landscaper put in a grapevine right at the back. Grapevine sits next to a much older hedge of lilacs, and in that hedge, the little birds love to spend a lot of time, winter and even summer, and they're always in there. And for 23 years, I waited for the birds to realize those grapes are food. Why don't you go eat them? And they never ate them until this, this fall. And I think it was because the grapevine was double in size and the grapes were sweeter. And one little bird obviously thought, I think I'm gonna try that. And now, even this week, I watch them from my kitchen window and they dive in, munch, 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 and uh, make a big mess, but I think it's wonderful. So that's my magic and mystery, and I know you all have your own little things, and this is the time to hold them close to you. Blessed be. Thank you, Susan. I would like to invite you all into a time of reflection and meditation. 
a time to center ourselves, to let the cares and the worries of the world drop away. Let your ears, your shoulders, and your ears move further apart. I know sometimes I find when I tell myself to do that, it's like, oh, my shoulders were pretty close to my ears. They need to come down. Uh, roll your, and if you might wish to roll your shoulders back, I invite you to settle yourselves, center yourselves, to feel the chair beneath you, holding you. Rest into the strength of these loyal and older chairs. <laughs> Feel the breath coming in and out of your nose. See if you can slow it down a little and follow its path. See if you can feel it entering your lungs and grabbing on to life-giving air. and then releasing that which is no longer needed. I invite you to do that two or three times with long, slow breaths. Give yourself a little wiggle. Is there any tension in your body? Are you completely resting in your chair? Let the cares of the week melt away. Allow your mind to slow and to know that you are here and safe and cared about. I'm going to offer you a poem, Mysteries, Yes, by Mary Oliver. Truly, we live with mysteries too marvelous to be understood. How grass can be nourishing in the mouths of the lambs. How rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity. While we ourselves dream of rising, how two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken. How people come from delight or the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem. Let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. Let me keep company always with those who say, look and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. Just have a moment or two of silence and then I will read the poem again. Truly, we live with mysteries too marvelous to be understood. How grass can be nourishing in the mouths of the lambs. How rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity while we ourselves dream of rising. How two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken. How people come from delight or the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem. Let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. Let me keep company always with those who say, look and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. 
We'll have another moment of silence, and then Karen will lead us into singing our meditation hymn, Winds Be Still. I'm just going to say, I just love it when the service leader reflection ties in with something completely unbeknownst, birds. We talked about birds in the song, and you talked about birds in your reflection. I just love that. So in the newsletter it says, in this service we will explore some of the rich traditions that help us turn our minds from the mundane to the miraculous. What is it that is important to you this holiday season? What creates magic and mystery for you? Let's gather and create magical moments together. Well, that's the description of today's service. And I think we have already created a little bit of magic here this morning. And again, thank you, Susan, for your wonderful reflection. I love hearing how others interpret and think about the monthly theme and the service topic. I was on a FaceTime call with my four-year-old grandson last week, and he was telling me how excited he is about Christmas. And of course, he's four. So what did he want to talk, talk to me about? presents, or cadeau, um, as he is mostly French. His mother asked him about what else he likes about Christmas, and he named the tree, and uh, he ran over to the tree and showed me, and, and also the nutcracker performance that they had just gone to. My daughter chimed in and said, and, and told me um, how going with her child to the nutcracker made her feel pretty verklempt, because I used to take her and her brother to the many community productions and concerts, including the Nutcracker, when they were little. It was what made magic for her, and now the tradition continues. For us in the Northern Hemisphere this time of year, we are experiencing the waning light and the plunge into the time of year with the shortest days and the longest nights. It is during this time of imbalance of light and dark that legends are made of. 
cozy fires, miraculous births, candles and twinkly lights, the magical time of keeping the lamps lit, along with personal and community traditions. This is the time of year when we remember the Maccabees, the small band that overthrew the Assyrian armor who had army who had been terrorizing them. During the time the Assyrians held the Israelites captive, they were unable, unable to celebrate Sukkot. I'm not particularly firm on that pronunciation. And so the Sukkot is the celebration of the harvest, and they would always celebrate that in the temple. But during this time, they were unable to access the temple as the Assyrians had control of it. They were rejoicing in their victory, and it was soon clear, however, that there was only enough oil to light the lamps for one night. And for this celebration, they needed enough oil for eight nights. Apparently, the Assyrians had destroyed all of the supplies in the temple, and they had nothing there for them to do their celebrations with. But they needed to rededicate their temple and their, their victory and, and regain some grounding and feel good about their own traditions. So they had to do the ceremonies in their entirety. Because, and they were so excited because now they were a people freed from the Assyrians and their cruel dictator. They went ahead, and you know the story, magic happened. The lamps stayed lit for the eight days with only one day's supply of oil. And that is what Hanukkah is all about, right? My colleague Gretchen Haley points out this nuance. But I think, she says, it's important that we remember. And what makes this story especially important for us today is that there's something else miraculous that happened here something that made the eight nights possible in the first place, which was the choice to light the candles, to light the lamp in the first place, even though everything seemed hopeless, even though it seemed like their efforts could not be enough. Sometimes we can get so paralyzed we don't do anything at all. But as we move forward together into the new year, it seems we need to do everything we can to help one another keep making the choice to light that first candle. We need to find those practices that help us connect with hope, with love, with joy, with gratitude. All those things that will keep us from despair. We don't know what the future will bring in our own lives or in the world. We don't know if our actions will be enough, just like they didn't know if their actions would be enough. But the only way they could be at all is to try. That's the end of the quote. I love this nuance of even though things aren't perfect for us, even if we don't have enough, we can do something. We can dig a little deeper, get a little more creative, ask for help, offer help, begin, even if we don't have the whole picture. I wonder if it is in these nuances of the miraculous stories where we can find some direction for our own lives and the life of this congregation. When my kids were little, I wanted to provide for them the best I could. I was single parenting and going to university full time for many years during their childhood. I couldn't afford sym symphony or nutcracker tickets, so I became a stagehand at the Sagebrush Theater in Kamloops and eventually became a volunteer stage manager for the symphony. I would then get free tickets, and that's why I did it, so I could take my kids to the symphony and to the other productions. And now my daughter has taken her son to the Nutcracker. And as I mentioned, it made her quite teary when I, she remembered all the shows her and I went to. And how it made such a difference in her life. 
She knew I had to volunteer and do hard work to get those tickets, and now the magic continues. Teo, my grandson, loved the show, especially, and especially the tutus, he said. He has a tutu, he told me, and then ran to get it and put it on. The tradition of discovering the magic of music and theater has just jumped to the next generation, and I'm so happy about that. We have no idea of how our, con our actions can ignite kindness, interest, tradition, magic, and mystery. Sometimes we're lucky enough to see the fruits of our labors. Sometimes we can only hope that our efforts create a positive effect someday. Going back to the Maccabees and their determination to have their traditions and their celebrations fulfilled, I wonder how we in this time and place can think about what we need to fulfill our hopes and dreams. And even if we don't have enough, how can we make a start? And sometimes just that start can create a momentum that can carry us further than we could have ever imagined. When you think about this time of year and all it brings, what brings you joy? What makes you feel stressed out? Where do you find moments of magic and mystery? I can guarantee that you, well, I'm pretty sure. I'm not going to do any guarantees. I take that back. I can almost guarantee that you probably have not found any joy, magic, or mystery in the malls. However, the experience may have left you pretty stressed out. I know it does me. I have a goal of not going into a mall this time of year ever again, and I mostly succeed. When people are asked what is magical and mysterious about this time of year, or what brings them that cozy feeling, they mostly answer with things like being with friends or family in an unhurried type of way, playing board games together, sharing favorite food, special beverages like wild, mulled wine and hot cider, going sledding or skiing or skating with family or friends. The answers are mostly about doing things with people we love and care about, laughing, talking, sharing food. Also important, people say how much they enjoy the spirit of giving this time of year, how much fun it is to try to think of that perfect gift for someone or make them something. I'm wondering what has brought that lovely feeling of magic and mystery to you this time of year. Not actually going to be, that's actually not a rhetorical question. I want you to think about that for a minute. And if you're on Zoom, you could um, think about putting something into the chat, and Ruth will holler it out at me and I'll repeat it into the, into the microphone if you're comfortable with that. For me, it has always been being with my kids, cooking and baking together going for wintry walks or snowshoeing with them, and especially making music together. What is it for you that creates that cozy, magical, mysterious feeling? Sitting in front of a crackling fire, perhaps. Does anybody have any, anything they want to shout out? And I'll repeat it back into the microphone. Jones. Light and going for walks. Light and going for walks. Anyone else? What is it that creates that magic and mystery for you when you think about this time of year? Snow. snow. We could use a little more. No, snow. No more snow. And we have, a, we have a dissenting voice over here on the snow part. Snow for, well, we need some more, we need moisture for sure. Snow for the trees. What brings that cozy, magical, mysterious feeling for you this time of year. Singing. Jan, is that yours? Singing, yeah. I'll be, Robert, then Ren. Uh, 
Robert says, my granny always had Christmas dinner, so magical time having Christmas with my, with my family. Wren. Baking and hot drinks. I'm not hearing any going to the malls. <laughs> going to the mall. Anything on Zoom, Ruth? Awesome. Jeff says, Braille tones? Braille tones concert yesterday was inspiring. For me, too, going to concerts this time of year is really. Fergie. Events and decorations. Events and decorations. Advent calendars. Oh. Yeah, advents and advent calendars and decorations. Concert this afternoon, Anti Meridian at Trinity. Trinity Lutheran. Andrew or Josh? I'm sorry. Andrew, I was right the first time. Christmas lights in the city, yeah. I went to Candy Cane Lane for the first time last year. That's something. <laughs> it really is, yeah. Anything else? A couple more. Cuddling with the cat and watching Rudolph. There are some great. <laughs> Behind me. Um, reading a Christmas, a child's Christmas in Wales. Whoa, I'm falling off the thing. Magic and mystery. The way something. <laughs> the way almost everyone makes time for others, including food. Usually including food. Alora. Cuddling up with my cat and watching Rudolph. Are you guys twins? Audrey and Alora. I was just reading it. Oh, you were reading it. Oh, okay. Walks outside. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Keep putting them in the chat if you like. And um, any last call in the sanctuary? My daughter and I have a book of um, duets, Christmas duets, and that's, um, that's our thing. That brings the magic to me. This is the season of, season of miracles. The story of lamps staying lit with no fuel so that people could restart their lives. The story of a baby born in uncomfortable conditions to the Virgin Mary. How this baby would go on to become a great teacher with many followers. It is the miracle of the birth, though that we dwell on this time of year. The stories that have swirled around this story, angels, wise men, cattle, the giving of gifts, and the star and the stories of exile that have resulted. The story of the birth of Jesus leaves us wondering if other miracles are happening all around us. Sometimes we're in an impossible situation and People just show up to help us at the right time and place. Has that ever happened to you? It's just like, poof. Or someone seems to understand us and help us out on the spot. Everyday miracles occur when we have eyes to see them. Let's take a moment as we prepare to light candles of joy and concern and to think about those everyday miracles in our own lives. Our hearts open to the messages of love and care that we show for one another. Those little miracles, everyday miracles, we call loving kindness. We light candles to let the to let one another know we are human. We feel joy and sorrow, and the lighting of the candle helps the energy to move into the community where our joy and concerns can be shared. The candle stations have been prepared for you, one on each side. I invite you to light candles of joy and or concern as you feel moved to do that. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Susan is going to light a last candle for all the joys and concerns and miracles yet to take place in our lives and in our hearts. Sometimes we don't even know it, but we're the miracle. Yeah, and once the candle wick gets wet, it's impossible to light it again. There is no miracle there. <laughs> yep, it just doesn't, uh, it just won't light. I tried down there. So thank you, Susan. And now we are going to sing our final hymn, Deck the Halls. Go out with a cheery note, and many people talked about uh, talked about how um, it is the decorations that they find magic and mysterious and delightful this time of year. Please rise in body or in spirit and sing together. Chalice? I don't think we have a... Is Chalice extinguishing? Okay, perfect. The Mystery of Being here by John O'Donohue. May you awaken to the mystery of being here and enter the quiet immensity of your own presence. May you receive great encouragement when unknown barriers beckon. May you take time to celebrate the quiet miracles that seek no attention. May you experience each day as a sacred gift woven around the heart of wonder. Thank you. I wish to thank everyone that took part in this service that contributed much. Weren't the slides great? Thanks to Doug Eastwell this week for doing the slides. He did a wonderful job. Thank you, Karen and Susan and all the people. I'll just have to say all the people, everyone that was here and contributed, and thank you to all of you who are here. Don't forget the Right for Rights campaign after the service, and please help yourself to some more coffee and or tea. I, I heard a rumor there was a cookie even, so that's pretty great. More than one. Okay. You don't have to fight over it. Great. And I offer you these words of benediction as you go into your week until we are together again to be renewed and refreshed. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Things can break and things can be mended, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So I invite you to go and love intentionally and love extravagantly 
and love unconditionally. The broken world is waiting for you, with your light, to brighten the world. Go in peace, gentle people, go in peace. And now let us link, do sing our linking song as we end. Um, the words will appear here. If you haven't been here before, we kind of form a loose circle and you can hold hands if you want. And the words...